have Tia Kim, so glad to have her here tonight. Please give her a hand. Thank you, Barry. Um, I am I am currently the, I've been at Mass Audubon since 1994, so quite some time. I am a, I'm a scientist, I'm a biologist by training, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a farmer by, by birth. I grew up on a dairy farm in Connecticut, so I've been at Drumlin Farm. I've been based at Drumlin Farm up in Lincoln, which, which was sort of a perfect combination of farming and science and mm -hmm. my job. I'm the senior naturalist at this point um, for the Metro West. We've regionalized since COVID. Um, and, and so what I do is this, I do a lot of educational outreach um, for adults. Um, <clears throat> and so um, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to take questions while I'm talking. I think that it's, I will try to speak up because um, I, um, I know it's, sometimes it's hard to hear in a, in a low ceiling room, but, I, but I can, I, if, if I'm not loud enough, just stick your hand up and wave at me. Um, but uh, where was I? Oh, questions. I think questions are better posed when, when you have them with the direct slide than to wait till the end. So if you have a question on a slide, go ahead and stick your hand up and, and, and we will stop and, and cover that for a minute. Um, we, can also, we can also do general questions at the end for a few minutes. Um, I aim for this to be about an hour, but I almost always run a little long, so I apologize for that. Um, and we're starting a tad a um, after our hour just to make sure everybody got here. But other than that, I think we're good. Um, so off we go. This is an image of Boston Harbor. Um, I have a, can you see my laser pointer? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And I, don't have to use, I don't have to use my external one. There's actually a walkway right here. You can, you can barely see it, but there is, there's a walkway right, right along the edge. And this is, this is the brand new Boston Harbor Walk um, that goes around sort of um, the, the harbor where the big hotel is and then the aquarium and stuff like that, um, covered by a storm surge in, uh, in a winter storm surge. I can't remember, a few years back when this picture was taken. Um, but that's, that's, a, that's a classic image of, of what's happening with our with our water, with our uh, ocean levels. A roadmap for tonight, our agenda. We will talk about climate change science. We will talk about the impact of climate change on Massachusetts. We will talk about the impact of, on wildlife, the impact on people. And then we will, we will cover solutions. We will cover some, some solutions because um, it's never, uh, you know, if you, just, if you just deal with what's wrong, then you're, that's not, that's never an effective, message to give people. That, and that, that applies to when you're just talking with each other also. Always aim for something, um, and we'll talk more about that as we go along. So this is, this is an old image, but it's, it's, you know, it's an interesting one that um, you know, this just indicates that our, our, we are currently, we've, we've shifted from a summer heat index um, that was sort of our norm as of the mid, um, 1900s to something slightly warmer, more like Pennsylvania and New Jersey. If we continued unabated until the end of the century, we will have a summer heat index like South Carolina. And people are like, well, so what's wrong with South Carolina? And it's because we don't belong in South Carolina. Yes? I'm just saying it's hard to see the map behind us over the Massachusetts city because it's so hard. It's so pale, I understand. So I don't know. I didn't at first get it. This is, the, here's, here's Nova Scotia all the way up here. Here's Maine. And so then New York, and we work down our way past Chesapeake Bay, all the way to Florida. Excuse me, I have a quick question. Yes, ma'am. Are we, because of climate change, and we keep getting warmer and warmer, are we also changing the zones that we are in for plants? Absolutely. The USDA has changed the zone map several times in the last, where, where the zone map was always pretty sacrosanct, it, would, it just stayed the same in the past, in the past 20 or 30 years, I bet they've changed it twice, if not three times. Exactly. We've gone from a, from a good solid five to a six something. Yeah. Absolutely. And th that's talking about plant um, hardiness maps for those of you who are not plant growers. Um, okay, off we go. So the whole issue here, that the issue that you hear about and the issue we talk about are the greenhouse gases. And greenhouse gases are a critical part of our atmosphere. Um, but what the issue 
for, for climate change, the issue of the crisis we are in now is the accumulation of greenhouse gases at a level far above normal. Um, the most prominent one is carbon dioxide. And not because it is the strongest greenhouse gas, not because it is, has the greatest impact in terms of, of its warming potential or its heat trapping potential, but because it is so prevalent. These other two, methane and nitrous oxide, are far more impactful in terms of their heat trapping potential, but they are less prevalent in the atmosphere than is CO2. Um, but what the issue is, um, I'm sorry, I, this, I'm going to put them all up there so it gives us time to look at them. Um, the, the appearing drives me crazy sometimes. So the, the issue for how does climate change work is exactly that by, by having more and more of the components in the atmosphere that trap heat, we have gone off the rails in terms of how much heat is being trapped. We need, we need these greenhouse gases. The thing is, is that we, we require an atmosphere that traps heat. Otherwise, we'd be like the moon and we'd go from you know, 200 below to 200 uh, above. Uh, you know, there'd, be no, there'd be no moderation of the heat or the cold from the sun and the lack of sun. So the, the atmosphere that we have is, is this heat trapping blanket. That's a, that's a really, that's a nice, easy image. And without that heat trapping blanket, life doesn't exist. The problem is when the heat trapping blanket is, is too, too heavy, essentially. It's, it's just that we've, got, we've now got a blanket that is way heavier than what is required to maintain our atmospheric um, health and, and the health of, of the, uh, the rest of the planet. OK? That's, that's how climate change works in 30 seconds. So <laughs> I, I don't mean to rush through it. I'm happy to talk more about it. But that's, that, to me, is, is, this, is, this, is, this is the basics. You know? so, so that you understand that the, the problem is the CO2. And, and this has all come about. And we'll, talk, we'll go through it a little bit more. Um, you know, like, I yes? I question or comment regarding emission on the cars. Uh, I see it just now in the strip mall, like we'll be shopping for five, ten minutes. There are two cars, people sitting in the car, cars run. Today, you don't need heat, you need air conditioning in the car. Mm -hmm. I, see, I see sometimes an hour of people sitting in there. I go for an hour walk, two hours walk. They're still sitting in the car with the car running. You know, today. Drives mean, you see crazy, the doesn't it? Yeah, I, I don't understand. I, I truly, I, I don't understand it. Um, there, there, are, there are rules about some vehicles, like buses. School buses are not allowed to idle. If you find an idling school bus, you can ask them to turn it off because it is a, it is a I don't know what the, what the level of, or, of ordinance is, but, but, uh, but it, is, it is a requirement that school buses not idle. However, there is no such requirement for somebody sitting in their car. You can't, I mean, you could, I suppose you could try speaking to them. I doubt they'd take it kindly. I don't know, but I'm, I, am, I am with you. I am stunned at people who seem so uninformed. And one time I had the courage to talk to a lady. I saw Good for her you. When I left for a walk, it was only half an hour, and she's still sitting in the car with car running. And, you know, I, but she looked not non-aggressive, you know. And so I mentioned, you know, about the car running, and the poison comes out of here, and she did not know that, that the gases are poisonous coming out of the cup. That's all. I mean, right. Where is the education? And that, I mean, that's, that's something that, you know, we, can, we, we will talk about as we go along. How do, how, do we, how, do we help, how do we help spread the message? Um, the, the, the changes that we have observed so far already, um, we, we are now, clo uh, we are now, I'm sure, three degrees warmer on average. That is an average. And, and the issue is not, you know, um, three degrees Fahrenheit is significant. And um, the issue is how fast we are changing as of the recent past. Um, so since 1895, three degrees. Since 1950, the growing season has increased by 15 days. And I don't know, I mean, you know, 
that's my lifetime, right? That's a human life, that's, that's, a, that's, that's not even, you know, that's a human lifespan that, that we have changed the growing season by two weeks, which is phenomenal. Um, sea level rise, it, that's an average of 11 inches around here. Um, it's different in different areas, different areas of the world and different, even different areas of the coastline here. The biggest issue um, in terms of the impact on humans and on um, natural systems is the increase in storms, which may not sound this, as significant as things like growing days and, and temperature, but that increase in storms is, is the one that impacts the infrastructure that we live in. And that is huge. And we will talk more about that when we get to the municipal vulnerability planning program, whatever the P stands for, I forget. But, uh, but that, that increase in storms is huge. It, it's, the, it's, it's the severity of the storms and how frequently those severe storms occur. Um, and that's where our, our infrastructure tends to get overwhelmed, as do our, our natural landscapes. Um, and so we will talk, we will talk about that. Um, some bit. Um, so, and, and wait a minute, let me, let me back up one second. The increase in storms is because of, of added energy. That increase in heat, that increase in temperature is a reflection of the amount of energy that's available within the system. Added energy in the system means that we have stronger storms. And that added energy, it all comes from an increase in the amount of sunlight that is trapped within our atmosphere, the amount of sunlight radiation, not just sunlight. Uh, it's, it's, all, it's all different forms of energy, but it all comes from, from the original radiation of the sun. <clears throat> okay, so we'll, we, we'll talk about energy a fair amount. Um, this is just, a, this is just a, one of our severe winter storms of recent past, just a little... A little uh, friendly chaos. <laughs> now, as we keep going, these are projections for the end of the cent of the of the uh, twenty of the twenty. What century are we in? <laughs> <laughs> we are in the twenty first century. I always have such a hard time with that one. So, at the end of the twenty first century, um, that we may in fact have a temperature increase of, of more than seven degrees. With a, you know, the, and this is another big one. The um, this d days that are over 90 degrees. Um, those of us that are older, you know, it was significant when I was a kid for a day to be over 90 degrees. And now it happens quite regularly. And, and when you look at this projection, by the end of the century, we're talking about a full month of the year that would be over 90 degrees. Um, sea level rise of five feet, that is huge. Um, and days, with two, percent, two inches of precipitation or more. So that is a very severe storm. Um, two inches in 24 hours is huge. And that, that would increase by 47%. That is, that is projections assuming nothing is done to, to uh, mitigate any of the impacts of climate change. Um, this comes from various, uh, there are various, um, and various and sundry organizations that are collecting and projecting this data. The Northeast Climate Science Center um, and the Climate Data Clearinghouse. Um, there is a there is a um, a website called Resilient Mass ResilientMA.org, which you can get a lot of information from. Um, these are all models, right? This isn't a given. These are these are modeled projections based on what we see and what we know is happening now, and what we what the uh, what the computer models project will happen in the future. Okay, so this is not a given, but it's a probability if we if we don't do something. Um, and and we feel we feel strongly enough that I'm allowed to say this as a representative of Mass Audubon. It's this isn't just um, pie in the sky or fly by night or any of those trite little expressions. But but this is this is stuff that we should be we should be aware of. Now, wild wildlife. <laughs> Wildlife in our changing Massachusetts. This is our, um, this is our state bird, the black-capped chickadee, um, which most of us, if we ever look at birds, most of us have seen one of these. They're quite common. This is sitting on a, on a sumac. Um, 
the, there is a potential that the bird will not be able to nest here in the, at, by the end of the century. If, if, we, if we continue with all of this information from this slide, then by the time we get to the end of the century, nesting conditions for our state bird will, will, not, will no longer be um, applicable. Maybe, maybe in the western highlands in the Berkshires, but not in the eastern Massachusetts. So, now, we're going we're gonna to we have to talk about, I know, it's, I don't want to go too heavy in the science, but we do have to talk about some, some science. We have to talk about some ecology, some, some, the way things relate. Everything is interrelated. So that all of these things are the key impacts that we've already mentioned. You know, average air temperatures will get warmer. The warm seasons will be longer. The cold seasons will be shorter. That is huge in terms of the way the organisms that live here have evolved. Um, they've evolved for particular types of winter. And winter is generally is the defining season at our latitude. All organisms are, are programmed, are, have, they have e evolved their adaptations to allow them to survive winter in one fashion or another in order to grow and reproduce and do all the other stuff they do, they do during the growing season. But, the, but the, the, um, what, they're, what they're aiming at is, is winter survival. Um, that's what that's the critical you can't if you can't survive winter you can't do the rest and so as winter changes and winter is showing the most um, amount of change at this point more precipitation as rain just look at you know look at how much rain we get in winter now versus how much snow we get we did have that one hugely snowy winter in 15 whatever 16 you know time just flies right by right you know, but so we had, we had that, but, but other than that, we often do not have snow cover, and we certainly don't have snow cover um, for the months that we used to, and that's very significant. Um, and the large precipitation events, them, just more precipitation at, a give, at any given moment. Um, sea level rise, and, and the acidity of the oceans. The acidity of the oceans, the oceans absorb huge amounts of CO2, and which is, a way of moderate it, and that actually has an enormous impact in moderating the atmospheric concentration of, of carbon dioxide, CO2. Um, but as, as the oceans absorb that ca carbon dioxide, the oceans th themselves become more acidic. And that has an enormous impact on, on the organisms that live in the ocean, particularly those with a shell. Anything that has some kind of a, of a, uh, of a calcium shell. Um, Will, will have more and more trouble with, with, with their own um, existence as the oceans become more acidic because it will dissolve the shell or they won't be able to lay the shell down. They won't be able to create the shell. Okay? So the big picture is that, um, as I said, the communities. We have, these, we have these communities. This is, this is, a, uh, this is a, an ocean. Um, this is... Well, let's see, what do we got here? No, we've got fresh water. So this, this is Chesapeake Bay. So, so this, is, this is all the stuff that's connected. You know, we have the bald eagle and the osprey are the big, you know, the big predators at the top, but then they have to have all these things in here to eat. They have to have this level in to eat, but this level has to have these things here to eat, and these things, you know, they have to have these things down here to eat. Herbivorous, this is saying that, <laughs> no, no. This is this is the, the the herbivorous ducks can be eating can be eating the bivalves. Nah, I was I was like, wait a minute. That, that, I don't know why they put the bivalve up there, but but the, the arrow is pointing at the duck, so the duck is eating the bivalve, not the other way around. I was going, clams don't eat ducks. Um, you can't fool me, you know. I, I've been around the block a time or two. Um, so the, the big issue is that all of these different levels are continue in ways that support the whole system. Should something happen, should we lose our, our zooplankton, then the whole system will collapse, right? And so that's, that's what we need to, that's the big picture. Like how does this all work together? And that's the thing we have to remember is that it's not just about whether or not we have bald eagles. Um, which these are sort of the charismatic megafauna up here at the top. Those are the things that we notice, but what they require are all these things that we don't pay much attention to in general, unless we happen to be somebody who, who, is, who is taken by, by natural events. Um, 
so it's that how it, this is a commute these are communities which has an impact on us as humans we think about community and this this biologically this is a community these are communities these food webs that that, that happen together um, and and thus the what's the impact of of uh, of a disruption at any given level and we don't we don't know we can model but we don't necessarily know uh, always the impact that will happen <clears throat> from some from an unforeseen interruption. Um, habitat loss is enormous. It's the impact of habitat loss is huge and and cannot be overstated. Um, this may not this may not look like much to us. You know, it's it's like a we got some peat. We got some we got some. Uh, you know, so so what we got a ditch. On the edge of the on the edge of the water, but this is this is a huge impact in terms of loss of salt marsh, loss of of nesting habitat, loss of food source, all those things. Um, so habitat loss is an enormous impact of of uh, climate change, and mostly that that comes due to increased severity of storms and increased sea level. Um, that think of think of Hurricane Sandy in terms of impact on humans um, and ha human habitat loss. Um, <clears throat> also, well, the other thing about habitat is we cannot, we cannot forget about, I, I don't know if you know the term carbon sequestration. I'm going to introduce that because that's an important aspect. All, all living things are made of carbon. The carbon that is inside a living thing or something that once was living, um, such as coal or oil or gas, all of that is sequestered, that it is held it is held in a form that is not carbon dioxide, is not methane, is not in atmospheric, is not gaseous. And so this, you know, a salt marsh sequesters huge amounts of, of carbon by trapping it inside the components of a salt marsh. And when we burn things like fossil fuel or peat or any of those things, we are releasing that sequestered carbon into the atmosphere. So carbon sequestration is a term you may come across quite often if you start, if you start looking um, to, to read more and more about this. Um, and so that, um, in, in fact, what, what the issue is, is, is how are we sequestering and where is it? OK. I don't want to lose anybody, but I don't want to, I don't want to dawdle. So if, if you truly. Raise your hand if, if, if you need more time on any, any one of these topics. <clears throat> now, here we have um, our, our forests. We are the temperate deciduous biome or ecosystem. That is the biome or ecosystem that we live in. There are, there are specific variety, variations in terms of your actual location, but all of northeastern North America is the temperate deciduous biome. It means we are composed of a forested biome that is mostly deciduous trees or mixed forests of deciduous and hardwood trees. And traditionally, um, you know, previous, previous to our current, our current state of affairs, we are a maple beech birch forest, predominantly maple and beech. Those are northern hardwoods that are, that are um, all within this red forested area. You can see that only, only up here in northern Maine um, do you get into the, into the more boreal forests, the more um, coniferous forests. Now, if we, if we continue on as, 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 we, as projected, we will end up with a much more southern type of forest. A much, uh, we will end up with, with habitat that is, um, or climate, and weather patterns that are, that are typical of an oak hickory forest. Um, that doesn't seem like such a bad idea, necessarily. What's the difference? Okay. I mean, and if you go out in our forest now, the forests that we have now, which are not primary forests, they are all secondary, um, we do have a lot of oak and hickory. So we, right now, we have, you know, we have a combination. We have all of these trees and all of these, these um, growing in our forests at this point. And the, issue, the, the big issue for plants is that plants can't move particularly fast, nor do they adapt quickly, right? They can't run around. Um, they can't fly away. And so, you know, if, if, the, if the system shifts enough that maple trees no longer can survive, then that, 
that's problematic in that they can't just move farther north instantly. Um, but in general, they will, still, they will be able to survive for some time that individual tree. Whether new trees will germinate and grow is a different question. So individual maple trees will survive, probably you know, well, well into the next century, even if, the, even if climate shifts. But what will, what will germinate and grow to replace those, old, those trees as they age out um, is likely to be uh, different species. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. So, you know, I'm thinking about the maple tree that, of course, you know, the, the little the seeds drop. And so the, the soil or, or the um, makeup of, of the um, environment is like it's too warm and it's too something else so that the seeds won't sprout and grow. The seeds may sprout, they may, they may sprout. They most likely will germinate, but, but remember a seedling has pretty high, usually a seedling has different requirements than a, than a fully grown mature tree, right? And so if our summers get very dry, then those seedlings may not get enough water when they need them, um, when they need it to, to get through that, that original, you know, sort of um, baby state, you know, where it's a little more tender and its, and its requirements are, it, it, it's a lot easier to dry out a seedling than to dry out a mature maple. It's got a very shallow root system, and that's probably one of the biggest issues is the amount of water that's available at any point in the given, or they may get flooded out. Um, the wet, the, our wets will get wetter and our dries will get drier. Um, you, you probably have noticed over the past few summers that we end, up, we end up most summers with a fairly significant period of time when we have no rain. And that is unusual. That is not the norm for our temperate deciduous biome here in the Northeast. Um, generally, historically, we get almost the, the same amount of precipitation any given month of the year. In the winter, it usually comes as snow. But we, we, we do not have, you know, we do not have months like, the, like a desert biome does with no water. And yet we are, we are going through periods of, of time in the summers now with five, six weeks with no significant rain. And that's, that's not the norm. So that would probably kill off those, those maple seedlings five or six weeks without rain. But not the oak? Not, they, they grow differently. Oaks, oaks have a, this is a total sidebar, but oaks are fascinating in that the acorn, oaks have evolved with squirrels, essentially. The squirrel buries the acorn, the squirrel and, or the blue jay, it's not just squirrels. There's lots of different organisms that do this, but they, you know, they, they take those acorns and they stash them someplace, and, where, and then they forget them. Because, <laughs> I mean, the animal that eats the acorn, it's not going to spread a seed because the acorn is the seed. Lots of, an, lots of seeds are meant to be eaten and then defecated someplace, and then that all, all, all good for everybody. The acorn is the seed, so, if the, so the animal eats the, eats the acorn, acorn's done. But it's the ones they forget. And that's what the oak tree is depending on, the ones they forget. Because they've been planted, for Pete's sakes. They're not just lying on the ground. You know, they dig a hole and they put them in. Like, what could be better, right? Um, so, so to, uh, that, I, I, you know, I mean, I, I, I love that connection and that, that, inter, uh, that, inter, that relationship between oaks and, and squirrels. But yes, at some point, maybe none of them germinate well. We're in, we're in, a, we're in a, a period of time where we can model our way up the wazoo, but we can't say exactly what's going to happen. Yes, ma'am. Um, do you have an idea of, of how many years it takes for, I'm just going to use trees as an example, mm -hmm. for something like that to adapt to a new environment? Okay, so this is, this is an excellent question. Like you've got, an, you've got a single organism, you've got that big maple tree. It cannot change its makeup as an individual. Maybe that's a maple tree that has greater capacity for cold toler, you know, for, co for cold, or heat, cold or heat or whatever. And so maybe that one does succeed and then its offspring, you know, that's the way adaptation happens. A single individual organism cannot change its makeup. It cannot change its adaptations. But it's, there's over time. Correct. That's what, that's what evolution is over time. Do you have any sense of time, say, for, 
for a maple, maple tree maple to, tree. Yeah. yeah. So how many centuries well, do we need? Well, well, that's the thing. Exactly. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. These these things these things have evolved over over you know millennia, right. and and the fact that they will not be able to evolve at the speed of change okay. that we have now. That I mean, that's a simple answer to that one. It, it, it's a very important aspect. The, the, other thing, the other thing to realize is that, is that we're talking about a maple beech forest. There's all kinds of other organisms in a maple beech forest or in an oak hickory forest. And so all of those organisms, if we think back to that, to the, uh, to the ducks and the bivalves and the, and the bald eagles, um, you know, that everything is related. So everything that, that is related to all these, all these different organisms is going to be impacted as well. It's, it's, um, we, can't, we can't study every little item, but... Mm -hmm. But it's still the same issue. Correct. It's still the same issue. And we don't have that time. So the, uh, another, another, another uh, good word here is phenology. And this is something that, that as humans we, pay, we, we almost automatically notice without even realizing what we're doing, that th when things happen... Spring, in particular, gives us lots of opportunities to notice when things happen. Phenology is the study of cyclical seasonal events. So when does, you know, when do the leaves open on, a, on an oak, on a white oak? When do, when do the, when do the uh, you know, I've got, these, I've got these, these little ephemeral spring flowers in my yard called, that I've um, called uh, bloodroot. And they open, they flower first, and then they open their leaves. And this year, I missed the flowers. They came and went so fast that I never even saw them. Now, I did, I admit that last week, I had my grandchildren here all week because it was spring vacation. <laughs> I mean, it, and so I was a little overwhelmed. But, but still, I should have, I mean, I, I, they must, remember those days when it was so hot? At the, a week and a half ago, mm -hmm. I'm, I, I don't know when they came and went, but I missed them because they've already leafed out. And this is this a month, ahead, mm, three weeks ahead of, of when I usually see the leaves. So that's, that's, a, that's an anecdotal piece of phenology. And we, what we need is data. We need lots and lots of data. We need to have consistent data over, over years and years and years. Um, so if you're a person who notices things, and can submit it. There's lots of places you, where you can submit phenological data, bud burst, when do the leaves open, when do the flowers come out? When do these things happen? They ha and the, tr the trick is, is that all of these things being related, they need to happen in connection with each other. When the plant leaves out is significant to the caterpillar that eats that plant, right? When the caterpillars come out is significant to the birds that eat the caterpillars. So it's all connected. Um, and, and as we shift, as our phenological events of one sort or another shift, they don't shift in the same orientation. Things are opening, things are opening, leaves are coming out earlier, but the birds are not returning earlier. Maybe by a couple days, but leaf out is happening by two or three weeks earlier. So that, that is a disconnect that will likely have an impact that we are not, um, that we can model, we can project. We don't know the the ultimate impact of that, of that um, of that disconnect. But that is that is of major concern. And there are lots of there's a um, there's a, a biology professor at BU who uh, Richard Premack who has been using data from Thoreau, and has been he sends his students out to Concord to collect data of what's happening right now. And then he, he relates it to, to what Thoreau, to the data that Thoreau collected. So that's been, that's, um, you know, stuff like that is, is good, good, good data that we can compare and see, see what the change is. Um, okay. Um, I know we're, we're bouncing around because there's, there's a lot to cover today. I'm sorry. but So when we're talking about ocean acidification, which we mentioned before, We'll, we will talk about the oceans a fair amount tonight because the oceans are enormously important, um, whether we live on the coast or not. And um, so acidification has a, a huge change in the chemistry of the ocean. This whole, this whole um, ecosystem here, which is not one ecosystem, obviously, but it, it impacts tremendously what 
what we're able to remove from the ocean if we want to put it in a human context. Um, we are very dependent on what we remove from the ocean in terms of, of how we use the ocean. And that ocean acidification is, uh, we don't know the ultimate impact of it at this point, except we are seeing it in terms of uh, changes, changes in, in uh, inshore and um, shellfish beds, things like that. Um, and all of, this, all of this has an impact on, on us as humans and has an enormous impact on the, uh, on the natural systems of the ocean. We are dependent on the oceans to moderate our temperatures, to supply food, to do all kinds of things, um, and, and they will become more and more disrupted. Another thing that's um, not ocean acidification, but another thing that's likely in terms of the oceans is that as the oceans, we, we all know about like the Gulf Stream and stuff like that, all the ocean currents. As the ocean temperatures change, that those currents are due to changes in ocean temp of, of the temperature of the ocean water, high to, you know, shallow to deep and, and north to south and all those things. And as, we, as the oceans warm significantly, the, the Arctic is warming faster than the equator, for instance, in, the, in terms of ocean temperatures, and it will change those currents. And, if, and there are people who, are, who their models and their, their projections are that the, the Gulf Stream will disappear. Well, that would have a, an enormous impact on us, yes, but on like Great Britain. The, the, the climate of Great Britain and, and Western Europe is, is because the, uh, it's all that warm water from the Gulf ends up, ends up in, uh, in Great Britain. They, yeah. they have, you know, they can grow palm trees in, uh, oh. in that little southwest, what's that called, Cornwall? They can grow palm trees in Cornwall. But should that change, Great Britain will not get warmer, it'll get colder because it won't have that warm water. So it's, you know, it's not straightforward. I know, this is really complex. Let's, let's get, let's, we'll go, we'll go through a, a few more, I know. We'll get, we'll get through some. So um, State of the Birds, Mass, Mass Audubon is a, you know, is a bird-centric organization and, and we release a, a State of the Birds report every few years and the, la the last one was some years back maybe 2017 now, I forget exactly, but the, the numbers up here are, are what we expect, that, you know, that lots of numbers, I, let's not worry too much about, about what they are, but that, that we, have, we have organisms that are highly vulnerable and, and likely vulnerable. We are, you know, black-capped chickadees is highly vulnerable because of loss of habitat and loss of breeding. Um, the, the birds that are most likely to stay and be successful are those that are urban and suburban nesting birds. Robins, cardinals, titmice, you know, all the birds that we see around our house on a regular basis, morning doves, um, pigeons. <laughs> well, we feed them, but also, that al also they just, they are, the, they are adaptable, they have an adaptable makeup. Um, more so than, than many other birds. Birds that ha are very specific, and, and um, that includes coastal nesting birds are, um, are, in, are in deep, deep concern, coastal nesting birds. Um, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So I noticed in the last few years, when, during the summer when we used to drive a car, it was full of... Dead bugs. Dead bugs, right? I don't see that anymore. How is that affecting the birds? There you go. That, that, is, that is, you know, I love that. You've made that correlation yourself and you realize, you already are, are aware that if, if there are no dead bugs, what are they eating? Exactly. We, there was a report that came out a couple years ago that was a combination of National Audubon and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, I believe, saying that we'd lost like three billion birds in the past 50 years. But nobody's counted the insects when, when you know, when I was a kid, you couldn't drive down the road in the summer without the windshield being covered with dead bugs. And, and people had those weird things they'd put on the front of their car to keep the dead bugs off the front of the car. Remember those? You don't need them anymore. There's hardly a dead, there's hardly a dead bug on the windshield. And that's loss of insects. And that, I am, nobody counts, nobody was counting insects. We've been counting birds for a long time, and that's great data. But what we haven't been paying attention to is like how many billions of insects there, there were 
you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, and how many billions of insects there are now, and where are they, and, and you know, who are they, and all those kinds of things. So that's, a, that's huge. I'm sure that if we had been counting insects more fully, we would be able to show that not only have we lost birds, we've lost their food source. Because especially nesting birds, they need insects because they need that protein. They can't feed, you can't raise a clutch of, of nestlings on seeds. Plus, there's just, there are not enough seeds in the spring. Seeds come in the fall. So you need insects in the spring to feed those baby birds. Yes, sir. I have been monitoring bats for about 40 years. And uh, about 40 years ago, they left in the fall, middle of October. Now they're leaving four weeks earlier every year. They leave earlier? September they're leaving. That's they're interesting. Leaving. And, and I wonder, is that, is that because? Is that because they need the food? Right. Yep. Yep. And yet they keep trying to sell you mosquito protection for your yard. is an Audubon member in American Bird Company, but I always wonder why we don't go to the non-believer. Well, if I'm a non-believer, I don't care. I've got my headphones on. I'm not listening. What, why do we need them? Who needs them? Who? Yeah. I mean, we never answer those questions in any of these articles about wildlife. We go on and on about it, but we don't. Well, I don't, I, don't know that you can, I don't know that you can convince people that they need them. If they're, if they're of the group that is convinced they don't need them, I think probably the best way to approach people who don't feel that it matters to them whether or not the chickadee lives in Massachusetts the, is, to, is to approach it from what does impact them. Hmm. I think you're you probably going to be... The fish, the fish thing, people get that real fast. Yep. But yeah, look at, the, look, at the cost of a, look, at, look at the cost of a clam. I just wonder who's even listening to songbirds anymore because everyone has these things in their ears. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the other issue, so segue, segue with the insects is, is pollination. And pollination is hugely important. Some vast percentage of our food sources all require pollination. And, and the vast majority of that pollination in terms of the, those things that are a food source for us are, are animal pollinated, it's referred to as, which, which the vast majority of those animal pollinators are insects. And so without insects, we, lose, we, we will lose pollination services. Um, in order for insects to be successful, they not only need plants that supply them with pollen and nectar, they need habitat to live in. And so those are, the, those are critically interrelated things to, to not lose sight of. You can plant all the pollinator plants you want, but if, if you have a yard that's covered in bark mulch under your trees, then you are not, you are not actually effectively helping those insects. And so that, those are the messages that we, you know, that we as, as regular folks who, who have a house and a yard can, can help to, uh, to, we can help spread that message. Um, that if, if in order to have, to have food, we need pollination. In order to have pollination, we need not only, um, uh, plants to pollinate or plants to eat from for those organisms, but we need places for them to live. Um, and, de and depending on the types of insects, we have some that are, again, like the birds, we have some that are very adaptable and very resilient, and we have some that we will lose, no question about it. We've, we've, uh, some of our more exotic or our more unusual, less common bumblebees, we've lost probably already or very soon. The eastern common bumblebee is, is very, it, you know, shows up all the time. It's not, it's not, of, it's not a species of concern. Um, <clears throat> but again, we go back to phenology. We go back to the timing of when things happen, when those, when those plants are flowering and when those insects are, are um, arriving and when those insects need, need either a host plant for a caterpillar or a flowering plant to, to uh, to nectar from. So it's, it's not an easy, it's, these, are, these are complex issues. Um, and so 
when people turn around and say, well, you know, what's, what's the problem with having a climate like South America, uh, like South Carolina, you know, just, just try, to, try to keep them based on where we are. We're not in South Carolina. I'm running way behind. I apologize. Okay. Oh, turtles. Here's a really interesting story, is that turtles, the, the um, uh, turtles, most turtles bury their eggs in a, in a nest under the ground and then leave. They do not incubate them. However, where those nests are and how those nests are arranged, the temperature within those nests determines for turtles male and female offspring. This is not uncommon in reptiles, and, and um, it's, it's significant. The, the significance is that as the nests are warmer, as the beaches, you know, for sea turtles, this has been this has been studied in sea turtles in Australia, but most likely applies to most turtles, is that with the sea turtles, as this as this as the sand has gotten warmer, they are producing more and more females. Not a problem at this point, except that as the males become less and less frequent, their um, reproduction won't happen. We it, at, if you don't have you, you need a few, you know. <laughs> Just a few. You know, I mean, in, in, in most, you know, in most ecosystems, you, you don't want a predominance of males because they're not, the, they're not the, the productive, they're not the productive resource. But you have to have males in order to have reproduction. And, and if it gets too warm, there won't be males coming out of these, these sea turtle nests. And so, um, so that's, that's an enormous, that's, that's another issue. Um, lobsters, this is, this is so, you can see that, that back in the mid back in the middle of the century, lobsters were being taken down here quite regularly, and then notice now they're all they're only taken up here. There is no lobster. There, this is this is determined by lobsters landed on you know in in a market. There is basically no lobster landings in New York anymore, Long Island, New York. They don't they have no lobster industry. It's moved up into the Gulf of Maine. Um, and that's, that's in, you know, and likely will move farther north as the ocean continues to warm. Shellfish, we, we've talked about shellfish a fair amount. One of the reasons shellfish are important is, is because of their significance to the habitat they live in. They are significant organisms in terms of maintaining a, a salt marsh and maintaining an estuary. With, they are, they are, they are in there. They are holding the, you know, the, they, they and the plants around them are holding the world together in that, in that habitat. And it's not just that we want shellfish to collect and eat, but they are a significant resource within the, within the ecosystem they are, they are found in. <clears throat> and so, the, so these are all, um, they also are filter feeders, so they help clean the water. I know in, Chesa in, in the Chesapeake Bay, they've, they've, they, they have people, you know, putting oysters out off their docks just because oysters are such excellent um, cleaners. They, they, clean the they clean the bay um, so effectively. And the absence of filter feeders means that, that you, know, you will have a buildup of nutrients, your ecosystem gets skewed, not, not a good thing. Um, so we've, we've now been through, we, we've been through a, a number of different scenarios of the, of the impact of, of climate change. On, on the wildlife, and now the impact of climate change on human beings. Um, harder, to, harder to specify in terms of, of, of you know, lots of things going on, but in general, climate change um, you know, has, has increased all kinds of stressors for many people, um, including, including you know, how we interact with each other. You know, the, the, how, how do you interact with somebody who, who leaves their car running for an hour in the parking lot? Um, you know, those are not easy to, not easy to do. There, there are, um, you know, all kinds of, of things. And the biggest of which I think at this point is, is changes in, 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 um, in illness, you know, health-related issues that are, allergies have increased, um, vector-borne illnesses and, and ticks. You know, that, the change in ticks is, is, is largely, I mean, part of that is due to the lack of cold winters. They, they overwinter more, more easily um, and, and stuff like that. So, so there, is, there is an enormous mental, physical, communal health issues. 
Um, so we can't, we can't not look at climate change and public health. We have to consider climate change and public health. Um, you know, how does heat impact people? And who is harmed the most? Who has the greatest impact? Um, worldwide, you know, I know we're talking about Massachusetts, but worldwide, migrations of people are driven by, by loss of, of effective places for them to live, which is partly based on climate change. Um, in Massachusetts, it's not, it, we, we, are, we are not seeing that dramatic an impact, but we are definitely seeing um, impacts that are, that are not equal across the board. Um, and <laughs> I'm sorry. That question is how is technology exactly. That, that could go on all night. That could, we could go on all night. Yeah. Now the the and the next slide. Uh, this is this is a slide that that indicates um, a process uh, a historical process called redlining. This is this is um, the city of Richmond, Virginia. This is an article from the New York Times, and they have studied a number of different cities. But redlining was where people were allowed, to, where people lived whether, um, and it was, it was isolated by race. And so the impact of redlining that took place in the middle of, of the 1900s can still be seen today in that what's available, where the tree cover is in these old redline districts, you can see that they, they have very little tree cover. You can also see that they are generally hotter today. And that is the impact of, 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 a, of a policy that, that was, that's, you know, was in place 100 years ago. Um, so, so how to mitigate, how to adapt. We'll talk, we'll talk about mitigation and adaptation, but we, we can't lose sight of, of, uh, of the, the equality, the, equ the equity of the whole system. So on we move. Let, we're going to strategies and solutions now. We we need to we need to come we need to come someplace where we can we can have we can have some impact, um, and and you know look at the, so here's here's a group of people I don't know exactly what event this is, um, but but you know these are people who are excited they're out there because they feel empowered, um, and I'm hoping that at some point you can feel some empowerment of your own whether you're a person who who joins a group, um, and uh, or not you can feel an empowerment that will give you a place to act. The, the, the issue is that we know how to solve climate change. It's, it's, a, it's, it's basically a, a, a question of math. You know, We've got to reduce the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Hello. Um, <laughs> so how, how do we do that? You know, we have to reduce emissions. We have to reduce what we're, what we're producing now. We have to remove. We have to figure out how to sequester carbon. We have to actually lower the amount that's there, and we have to adapt. So we have to, we have to adapt our systems. We have to help the, the, the natural world adapt. Um, and you know, and then, then we've got, the, we've got the, the situation under control once we've done that. Easy. I'm sorry? How does the right hand photo? You know, my, my, I'm not. This is not my photo, so th I, that's a good question. I'm not sure what the, they, what I would say they're doing is creating some kind of, of uh, buffer system. It looks like it's, it's hard, it looks like a hardscape surface, but they're not, but my presumption is they are not creating a solid hardscape. We have discovered that, that natural systems are much better if you do not put a barrier solid. Um, if they need some protection, then you put you put barriers that are that I guess are. The main point is that people are working together. People are working together. So you know, community effort is is enormous. Yeah. Um, creating more green space is enormous. Figuring out how to how to produce energy without fossil fuels is enormous. Um, community planning, mu municipal vulnerability preparedness. This is a this is a, a whole um, state funded. Program. These are the um, community. Not all not all cities in the in the Commonwealth have done this, but many. I don't know what percentage have. Mo Walpole is one that has a community vulner vulnerability preparedness um, planning. They have done. Um, but this is how it. How can a community adapt and figure out how to m um, deal with the fact that 
you know, a six hour 10 year event, what is it that, you know, what's, what's like a, you know, that's every 10 years you're going to have a precipitation event of significance. Well, in 1961, it, it was less than it is now in terms of what we were preparing for. The, the, the bigger event, which theoretically was o is only supposed to happen every 100 years, and we're finding it's much more frequent than every 100 years at this point, is, is also much higher right now. These, you know, this is, this is all, all standards that are, that are produced by, by um, the, the, our government agencies. The, the, the big thing for, for most towns is that it actually saves money to, to plan mitigation, to plan how to, to be prepared for these assaults on the infrastructure. Um, and, and that in the long run, if you, can, if you can figure out how to mitigate for those assaults on the infrastructure, it will, it will save you money. You, um, Walpole, if you go to your walpole.gov page, you will find your um, municipal vulnerability preparedness. It was produced in, in uh, 2020. Um, it's actually a significant document. It's quite like 160 pages. I didn't read it all. Um, but you ha and what's interesting is that most of it, it was, it was done with a, with, a profession, with a group of wetland science professionals, I'm sure. Um, and a lot of it is, address, is addressing the water infrastructure. You, there's, this is part of, most of Walpole is in the Neponset watershed, and you've got a bunch of little rivers running through here, and what happens when those rivers flood? And how does that impact what happens? Um, you know, some, when we had those, that very flooded winter, flooded spring, whenever it was, again, past 10 years or so, I know, like, the downtown Wayland was basically underwater because of the Sudbury. Um, the Sudbury had no place to go, so it overflowed its banks by feet, several feet deep. Um, the library was underwater. They had to completely empty the library. Um, and I'm, sh you know, that, so that's what Walpole, that's what, that's what we're looking for is, you know, where, like, a road crossing assessments. Where are the roads going to be washed out? You know, what can we do? Where, where, you know, and how can we engage our community? And so this is all, this is all part of what's here in this town. Your, your specific MVP, your specific vulnerability preparedness. And, and so I, I encourage you to go and check it out. Read it, ask about it. Is it being implemented? Is it, is it actually being implemented? Um, is, is it happening? There were, there were um, you know, and just, just keep track of what's going on and how you can, maybe you can help be part of it. So in terms, I keep using the term, I've, I've used it several times now, adaptation and mitigation. Those are two different, those are two different terms. Um, and um, things that are, that are um, unavoidable, we have to adapt to. Things that will happen no matter what, we have to adapt to. Beyond that, we need to mitigate. We need to reduce, re reduce how much is going to happen. This is, this is the projection of, of uh, projected global average temperature if we do nothing. This is if we, if we, if we mitigate. So we adapt and we mitigate. Um, we need to, you know, we need to make huge reductions in the amount of, of uh, emissions that we produce in the near future. Um, and, in order to mitigate. But the, adap the adaptation part is, is uh, you know, act actions that we can do at this point that allow our infrastructures to, to be more um, resilient. And our, and our human infrastructures and our, and our native infrastructures. Um, permeable pavement, you know, oh, this is, uh, this is down, this is uh, the, um, down at the, you know, the big, that big building with the hole in the middle of it um, in Boston. Oh, what's it called? I can't remember. Sorry. Um, planting, planting uh, you know, having, having um, herbaceous material instead of a, instead of a, a hell strip of nothing but lawn. Um, you know, all, all different kinds of ways that you, can, that you can mitigate. I mean, that you can adapt your environment um, and that will cope with what's, what's going to happen. Um, resiliency is, is a huge, it, resiliency is a, is a term that, that is exactly what it sounds like. How can we create and, and, and have our systems be more resilient to the, to the stress that is coming? Um, tree planting 
is a very low impact development. That's a LID, low impact development, is a term that is that will be it is thrown about in your in your MVP quite regularly. Planting a tree is an is a low impact development thing that that's worth doing. Um, kind of on the flip side of that, is there what's the cost of removing trees? I mean, are there that there's people always removing them and there's never anything to replace them? Correct. And so that's something that that's something that the community as a whole needs to address. The town I live in. Um, homeowners are not allowed to cut down trees greater than 14 inches, I believe, without permits. So when they go to do any, any work in their, in their, but then again, people do it all the time because they get fined, you know, a thousand bucks and they don't care. I'm sorry. That was, I will not do that. <laughs> you know, and no, but that, that's, that's a tremendously important community question. If, you're, if you take down the trees, what, you know, if you have to take down this tree, then what are you going to do to, to make up for that tree that you've taken down? So one question about trees and absorbing CO2. Correct. There was someone who told us one time, we were putting up um, solar panels, and we have trees that go like uh, more than 100 feet in the air. And what was said at the time was that younger trees were sequester faster. More than my old trees. Yes, but your old tree, there's a whole lot sequestered in the size of the tree, okay. physically in the tree. Younger trees sequester more carbon because they grow faster. Okay. So per unit of size, it's a, you know, it's a teenager versus an adult, okay. right? That exactly, and so, but so there is an issue with taking down a mature tree in terms of the amount of carbon that's that's just sequestered in the wood of that tree. Mm -hmm. um, also, different types of trees sequester more carbon as they're growing. Okay. So, not a straightforward answer. I'm sorry, we're running way over time. Mitigation is something more distinct in that it is it is a means of reducing the amount of emission. Um, and to prevent the accumulation of more, more, uh, more greenhouse gases. This is, an, this is a, a pie chart of, of what's the source of our, of our greenhouse gases, and this is averaged around the country. Project Drawdown down there in the left-hand corner, that's a really interesting resource in terms of, of the amount of information you can get out of it. I highly recommend looking at Project Down, draw, Drawdown if you're interested. In you can see that the production of electricity is huge, especially in New England. The production of electricity is probably our greatest fossil fuel emission source. Um, we should be able to change that. That's something we, we need to address. Forest fires. I thought I saw something in California they said it was on the same order as transportation. On, but That's, does that show up on this, or is it small? Not for us, because right. for, forest fires aren't, aren't right. one of our critical issues. But, but in California, where they are burning hundreds of thousands of acres at, you know, every year, practically, it seems like they are, they are in a cycle. That, and that probably is on an, on an order of transportation for them. Um, for, for us, in this part of the world, it's not. But, but California's forest fires are the result of climate change. So... Um, but yeah, the, I mean, you can see it, it's, it's, a complicated, it's a complicated series of, of information. Um, where the carbon goes, the, the issue, you can see, this is, this is what we need to reduce, where the carbon goes. We need to get more of it, we, we need to get more of it in, in other forms. Um, biological sequestration is temporary, is the thing to remember. Um, is that anything that's biologically sequestered is going to change as that organism grows, dies, decomposes, all of that stuff. There are, there are people actively working on engineering a, an, a, a, a carbon sink that we can create some kind of system where, where we can sequester carbon um, through engineering. I, I have great faith in the, in the ultimate creativity of human beings. And I feel like that's something that, that we may, in fact, be able to come up with, um, is, a, is a way to sequester large amounts of carbon. It's never, it'll never be cheap. But. We talked in Switzerland, they have some units, some flat water, 
Yeah. Exactly. We we just need to do it on large scales. Yep. Yeah, do it reverse smokestacks. That's what we need. Nature-based solutions is huge. I think this is something it's, you know, it's, it, the example of, of, of California burning, you know, the, if we, can we reverse that? Can we actually, you know, recreate those, those forested communities um, or recreate those wetlands? Um, here, here it is before planting and here it is after planting. Um, you could, um, uh, the, planting, the planting was probably uh, the product of a, of a couple of seasons, having it develop that well into that, into that much of a habitat, uh, four or five years. It's not as long as you would think. Not no. Coastal wetlands are huge. Um, this, is, this, is a, this is an image of a, of a property that was, that was given to Mass Audubon in Plymouth. It's an old uh, cranberry bog, and it has been, um, this has been dismantled, the cranberry bogs and all the channeling. The water flows as it should. We have swamps. We have fens. AWC is an Atlantic white cedar. Um, you know, we have a completely different set of habitats um, as opposed to cranberries, right? Cranberries, no diversity. What you need is diversity. Diversity, resilience. This is Tidmarsh. It's in, it's in Plymouth. And it was a large cranberry bog that was, that was given by a family um, to, the, uh, to the organization, along with, very generously, the, the money that was required to be spent to do this work. That's the other issue, is that what it, this, you know, it, none of it's free. We've got to spend money, though, in order to be able to, uh, to, to lay claim, you know, in order to be able to make a difference. Question. Yes, ma'am. So, who designed that? Who designed this? Yeah. Um, we, uh, that, that was done with, uh, with um, ecologists, you know, specialists. Uh, you know, it, it's, you have to go back to, to what makes sense in this particular, you know, what, like what, what water is here, what's going on here. You can't, you can't put a swamp in some place where it's an upland forest. So, you, you know, you just follow, you follow what the, you follow what the, what, what the ground is like. You follow what the basic hydrology is like. And then you can, you can recreate. You know, then what would have been there historically, we, we know that. We look at history. We, we, you know, we use, we use the experts. It's not an easy process, um, but, it, but it's effective. It's, uh, you know, it's something you can, um, it's something people can do in their own in their own landscapes is is try to figure out how to make your landscape more diverse and more resilient, and and a uh, and a better a better source of uh, good habitat. That's always going to be important, whether it contributes directly to, to uh, your climate footprint. I think it actually reduces it, but but that's but that's a uh, you know that's that's an enormous issue. Um, this is this is Mass Audubon's own own commitment. We're trying to be carbon neutral by 2050. Um, greener buildings that we're building and greening our old buildings. We have some very old buildings which are hard. If you have an old house, you, you know that. It's hard to, it's hard to make it efficient. Um, generating a lot of electricity um, through the use of uh, solar panels. A any, any building we put up at this point has solar panels. Sig far more solar capacity than the building requires to run. Um, we are replacing, we are gradually going to electric vehicles. And also we've, we've, um, the, the, the one, the sanctuary I work at, we, we are a farm as well. And so the concept of, of locally produced food is huge. Um, you know, transportation and the food industry is, is enormous. Sorry. Um, and, uh. But so that's just, that's just our organization's commitment. Um, we also do a lot in terms of, of climate advocacy, trying to, trying to arrange, trying to impact and influence what's happening around both the state and, and even, even uh, beyond the state. Um, you know, what, how, we, how we, we won't have an impact one at a time. We will have an impact altogether. Our impact will be huge, will be much bigger um, if we work together. And, and in the process of reducing our, 
our carbon footprint. You know, we're already, we, the carbon footprint was reduced by, f the Ma Mass Audubon's carbon footprint was reduced by 50% over the course of about 10 years. So it's significant. I mean, it, uh, you know, we've got a ways to go, but it's still significant. And things that you can think of in terms of your own impact, what you do, um, there's lots of different ways to, to, uh, to look at what your carbon footprint is. Um, it's not insignificant, and I think it's, all, it's good for us all to think about our carbon footprint and how we, how we can reduce it. And it's not that you have to do everything. This is the, the I want to get to this slide, which I think is, is, is an important one. This is, this is um, the, a model from a, it's a woman in the next slide, actually. But what is, it, what is it that you can do? What is it that you like? What, what needs to be done? And what are you good at? And then, then you come down to not only what you should do, but what you can do sustainably for yourself. You don't want to be out there trying to do, you know, trying to do something that is not work that you feel that you, can, that you are comfortable with. Um, so, so figure out, but, but don't, don't figure, if, oh, I can't do that, so I'm not going to do anything. Um, I think if we all, if we all come up with, with what we're good at and, and what needs to, that com this, this, this little Venn diagram, you know, of, of uh, what, what gets you out of bed in the morning and, and, uh, and, and what you're good at. I think this is, this is huge. This is, this, this is from this woman. She is a, she's a, um, an oceanographer, climate scientist. She's a fascinating woman. Um, most of us probably haven't heard of her, but she's really interesting. Ayanna um, Elizabeth Johnson. Greta Thunberg, most of us probably have heard of. Um, and, and I think the big thing here is acknowledging that it's difficult, acknowledging that things are hard, but then find a way to get past that despair. Um, find a way to, to engage yourself in something so that you're, you're, you've moved beyond the despair. This is a group of organizations in Massachusetts. These, are, these, in, these organizations are all active in, this, in, in, in our own commonwealth. Um, so there's lots of places. Yeah, that's a good idea. Screenshot. Um, there's, lots of, there's lots of organizations that you can get engaged with. And there's, there's stuff in your own town. You know, Barry belongs to the, Green. to the Walpole Green. There you go. Um, and so just think about, you know, what's going on around you? What have you noticed? Um, you know, what, what, how has climate change impacted you or someone you know? Um, and, and, and what's going on in your own community? Um, I realized I'm, I'm unaware in my community because I, I haven't been paying attention. I need to, I need to uh, modify that. I need to address that. Um, and, and I think that will help us, that will help us come up with the bright spots um, and, and not, be, not be overwhelmed by the, uh, by the holy moly, you know. <laughs> you don't want to be, the holy moly can just get you all the time. How do we know when it's too late? Right. That's a that's a very good. That, I mean, and I think for, for I think for a number of people, there is the attitude of it's too late, and I can't do anything about it. But that is a that's you know that's the ostrich with the head in the sand, um, and and it's a way of of kind of avoiding the need to do anything. It's too late, so it doesn't matter what I do, and I it's not too late. Um, it's too it. It's not too late in the big picture. It's, I'm sure it's too late for a few of the smaller, you know, there, we will lose some species, we will, whatever, you know, we will, we will change. Change is inevitable. Environmental systems, ecosystems, the world in general is not static. Human beings don't really like change, so we try to keep it static, you know, and we, we want it to be the same, and that's just not, that's not, not the way the world functions. Um, by trying to keep things the same, we are fighting a natural system. So how do we keep things from changing so f fast that the natural system can't keep up? There you go. But, but, but you know, go, go away with, with, a, with a feeling that, 
that you know that at least I hope you can go, you can leave this evening with a feeling that that uh, you know we can we can all accomplish something if we put our minds to it, especially if we put our minds to it together. Mm -hmm. I really do feel that humans are are creatively um, capable of of solving all kinds of things, which we've done in the past. We've solved all kinds of issues. What town do you live in? Uh, the t I live in Wellesley. Wellesley. I do live in Wellesley. <laughs> I actually, I I. Uh, I live at, I live on a school campus. It's where we where we worked for years, but. Yeah. Um, oh, so that brings us up to the toilets out in Broadmoor. We had it for years over the toilets. Oh, the composting toilets. That's right. Yes, I want one at home. A composting toilet? They're actually a lot easier to get to uh, to to use now nowadays. They don't need anywhere near the. They're they're much smaller and more compact and and much more effective. So you. You know, composting toilets are not out of range for, they're not, in, they're not inexpensive, but they're not. They're about, I think they're going to close the library on us in a minute. <laughs> so I apologize for running, for running well over time, but um, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. And thank you, for, thank you for coming. I know some people, obviously, they, they had to go, but, but thank you for being here with us.